Hey everyone, uh, welcome to uh, concurrent session 3A. This is a lightning round. Um, I'm gonna be the moderator for this session. We're gonna hold all our questions till the end. So if you have any questions, just pop them in the chat um, and I will read them to our uh, presenters at the end. Um, John, Mark and Rochelle, are you ready to go? I think you're up first. We're ready. Just a moment and I will share my screen. But um, thank you and welcome. Can people see the slides? Let's see. There we go. <laughs> Welcome. I'm John Mark Ockerbloom, and I'm presenting today with Rochelle Nelson. And we're speaking to you today from Philadelphia on the traditional lands of the Lenape people. We're talking today about work we're doing at the Penn Libraries to help make historic serial content in our collections freely available to the world by having staff across our libraries research their copyrights and share our findings through linked open data. Like many research libraries, the Penn Libraries own many volumes of serials from the 20th century. Many of them don't get much use. They're not easily accessible. Even before the pandemic closed our stacks to the public, many had been shipped to off-site storage. And while mass digitization has made many of the really old volumes accessible online, Content after 1925 usually isn't available online without subscriptions, if it's available at all. But we know that many of them up to the 1960s, or even the late 1980s, are out of copyright, since most of them didn't renew any copyrights, and some might not have claimed a copyright to begin with. When the COVID outbreak sent our staff home, we saw an opportunity to have them help research the copyrights of serials that we own and also to see if any of them were already free online with or without copyrights. We created a table of over 10,000 serials that we own from the mid 20th century and a questionnaire to gather information on their copyrights. We're publishing that information as structured JSON data linked to Wikidata. We're also linking to free serial content when we find it. That's all helping make this content widely available to the world and getting the attention it deserves. I'll turn things over now to Rochelle to show how our process works. Thank you, John. 25 staff from 14 departments signed up to work from home on this project. A questionnaire we designed for them to fill out can be completed in any web browser without any extra software or specialized expertise needed. Staff search our catalog, the Copyright Office database, and other online resources to enter information about a serial's country of origin its copyright renewals, its copyright notices, and any free online content. We held training sessions on Zoom, showing how to work through the forms step-by-step. Step. We answered questions from staff, and we made recordings and guides available for staff working on the project. After a staff member fills out the questionnaire for a particular serial, their response gets put in a queue for others to review. This is where more specialized work comes in. Right now, John double checks the answers given, edits them as needed, and then runs a script to create a JSON file with a unique identifier. The JSON file encodes copyright information in a form that can be processed by machines. It's also used to create serial copyright web pages like the one you see here. We make sure the file acknowledges the people who worked on it. If our workers found free online content for the serial, either from our existing catalog records or from searching online, other workers then create records that link to that content. Those records are discoverable in Penn's online books page. We also make sure that there's a Wikidata item for the serial. If there isn't one already, we create one. When we add the unique identifier for the serial's JSON file to its Wikidata item, a link gets automatically created to our copyright information, information page on that serial. We now have several librarians working on these serial records in Wikidata, and we also have other librarians working on methods to automatically add Wikidata records to serials not already registered there. The Wikidata identifier and the ISSN are what tie all of our data together. They help ensure that we can link our copyright information about a serial to our catalog records, and they make it clear what serial we're talking about when we describe one. As we've increasingly relied on ISSNs in this project, 
we found that many of the ISSNs in our catalog were incorrect or canceled. We've been fixing them as we find them. We can do that with our own catalog records and with master records in WorldCat. We've had more difficulty with our Alma Community Zone records because we're not allowed to edit ISSNs there. We've also run into limits on how much authoritative information we can get about particular ISSNs because we lack an ISSN portal subscription. Overall though, we've been fortunate to draw on a long history of careful work that serial catalogers have done to describe and trace the history of serials and to locate online content. We're very grateful to be able to build on that work. Thank you. In our current project, we're concentrating on serials owned by Penn, but others may be particularly interested in different serials. This page links to lists of serials in popular subscription packages that may have public domain content. It also links to lists of serials written about in Wikipedia. Anyone can research or ask about serials that are of interest to them in these sets. And as we fill in information on serials in Penn's table, or in another table shown here, that information also appears in other tables that include the same serial. So, if you're interested in using or digitizing content from 20th century serials, or if some of your users are, you can consult our knowledge base to see whether that content is still subject to copyright. Our project page includes a decision guide that you can use on, which tells you how to use the information we've gathered on, and how to look up in additional information if you need to. In the future, the serials we're researching might simply become open online for everybody. We've been talking with Hathi Trust about a pilot program to review and open up volumes for some of these serials after 1925 based on our data and recommended procedures. You can also build on the work we're doing. We still have thousands of serials in our collections to research, and we welcome participation from people at other libraries, as well as our own workers. If you're interested in a serial not on the Penn Libraries list, you might find it on one of the other deep back file lists we have on our site. Or you can make up your own list of serials and research the titles in it like we do. If your list is likely to be of wide interest, you can talk to us about possibly having it featured on our site as well. We've been able to do as much as we have in this project thanks to the dozens of people working at the Penn Libraries who have given their time and talent to it while we've all been trying our best to write out the COVID crisis. If you go to our project page at the URL on this slide, you'll find the credits for their work as well as links to all of the information, documentation, and training we've produced. We hope you found this presentation informative, and we'd be glad to talk with you if you'd like to learn more about it or get involved yourself. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Rachel, you're up next. Okay. Thank you very much. Let me uh, toggle here to full screen. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Michael Rodriguez, a collection strategist at the University of Connecticut, and here to talk to you about rethinking print journal subscriptions at a large research university. Uh, for those of you who are not uh, women's basketball fans, uh, UConn is a top 25 public research university, uh, R1. Uh, we have over 32,000 students and 1,500 faculty, so fairly large, uh, and a $5.3 million collections budget. Uh, from that budget, we acquire 167 print journal subscriptions, 108 of which are in the general collections, the rest go directly to special collections. <clears throat> the goal of general collections, of course, is access over preservation or collecting depth. We really um, collect journals to be able to provide convenient access to our users at point of need. Uh, and our goal in doing so really is not preservation or building particular depths in collections, unlike our special collections colleagues. Uh, UConn is not a member of any uh, shared print or cooperative collection development initiatives around journals, so we had no external obligations to retain print subscriptions. So every year or two, like most libraries, we reviewed our print subscriptions and every year or two, we canceled a handful of them that had moved to online access or that were clearly no longer relevant to our researchers. What we wanted to do uh, over the summer of last year and into fall was to break this cycle, was to make a decisive break from print where appropriate and let the data and the known demand drive us. 
And this was happening in a much larger context, of course, of the pandemic shutdowns, where the stacks were closed for over a year, um, where most staff were working off site and print really was not accessible. And it was happening in this larger context of almost universally declining use of print materials. Um, if, if you read the literature, you see that reflected time and time again. And was also reflective of the library's larger pivot toward and on-demand access over uh, big deal subscriptions uh, where we could. We also factored in the total cost of acquiring these print journal subscriptions. While, they, while the acquisition cost may have been inexpensive upfront, they still had to be received, cataloged, shelved, uh, and so on, and kept in storage uh, indefinitely, which increased the cost significantly, of course. So our process was fairly straightforward. We extracted from our uh, serials management agency, EBSCONET, uh, extracted a spreadsheet of all individual print journal subscriptions at UConn, including data such as ISSNs and titles and publishers and costs. Uh, I worked closely with our humanities librarian to determine criteria to adopt for our review, and then use those criteria to conduct exhaustive data investigations, which took about 12 hours over two weeks. The whole project took about a month. And I composed a one-page report, which was ratified by library senior leadership without alteration to our recommendations. <clears throat> our retention criteria were threefold. Uh, to consider a title for retention, we really want in print, we really wanted to see no online institutional access option. If there was one, we moved it to electronic. Um, we also wanted to see five or more instances of interlibrary loan or scan on demand activity uh, over the past three years. Interlibrary loan being when we scanned an item to lend it to another library and scan on demand when we scanned an item to lend it to one of our own patrons. And the third criterion was the journal had to have fewer than 100 WorldCat holdings. This number was arrived at in dialogue with our interlibrary services colleagues who assessed that journals become progressively harder to obtain through ILL when there are fewer than 100 holdings in WorldCat globally. And to be considered for retention, titles generally had to meet at least two of these criteria. We really wanted to see overlap between these categories and, uh, and not simply say that if you meet one, we're going to keep the title. There were a few limitations to this approach, of course. Uh, the big one was that there was no data for browsing or in-house use. UConn does not barcode its journals or consistently keep track of in-house use. Um, so we weren't able to come up with really quantitative metrics to assess that. What we did find, however, was thick layers of dust across almost all of these titles, which indicated uh, that they had been undisturbed often for years. We also did, uh, did not collect title level feedback in advance from liaison librarians or faculty. And we made this decision very intentionally because we wanted to keep the reviews focus not on perceived intrinsic scholarly value, but on the current evidence of need and use. <clears throat> Our analysis found that 30 of the 108 titles were already available online through JSTOR, through aggregator databases, or through open access on publisher platforms. Only 30 titles had documented internal use, and only 38 had any ILL requests. And for multiple requests or usage, the numbers were significantly lower, averaging out to about one use per title, which was pretty minimal. Uh, and only 19 titles had fewer than 100 WorldCat holdings. So these were pretty widely held and readily accessible through ILL. The upshot of this analysis was that we indefinitely suspended subscriptions to 100 print serials, 93% of all the ones to which we subscribed. We retained eight, one of which we moved to special collections because it fell better within uh, their collecting areas. We cut costs by about $9,000 per year, um, so fairly minimal savings, but still not insignificant. And we actually are going to purchase JSTOR Lives in Literature, the collection, because some of the uh, quite a good number of those print journal subscriptions were represented in JSTOR. Uh, because we anticipated minimal impact on end users, we did not publicize these decisions widely outside of the library. We really wanted to see organic feedback and usage um, shape any decisions we make to resubscribe. And to, for building back any subscriptions, we we're going to take into account that user feedback and also use the rough, the metric of um, 10 ILL requests per year, at which point a ILL cost may begin to exceed the potential subscription cost. Very rough metric, but we're going to start analyzing our ILL data much more proactively moving forward. 
This helped us retain agency over our budget and practice good stewardship of the uh, environment of scarcity. And I'll add too that for, for our one university, UConn's was a pretty, seems to be a reasonably groundbreaking pivot from print. I mean, we have all canceled print, we have all done format conversion, but we haven't sort of been en enacted a decisive pr pivot from print uh, as, a, as an industry. Uh, so hopefully this can help inform uh, any, any efforts um, toward this direction. I include some further reading, which you're welcome to revisit um, uh, in the recording. And I'm happy to take any questions after our next speaker. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Emily, you're up now. Uh, hi, okay. <laughs> uh, let me just share my screen real quick. Okay, <laughs> thanks for your patience. Um, so my lightning talk is on saving time on renewals with Excel in Python. So hopefully uh, it pairs well with that last presentation. And um, I'm somebody who really enjoys playing around with Excel and I can't promise to teach anybody Excel or Python in the short limitation time-wise of a lightning round talk, but I thought I would walk you through what I look at when um, journals come up for renewal. So I created a hypothetical scenario um, it's a world in which we subscribe to every OUP title, and that's a little under 400 journals. And so the three pieces of data that we're looking for is what the renewal will cost, um, what the counter usage stats are, and whether or not we have access to these titles from other vendors. So our starting point is essentially three different spreadsheets. Um, so the first step is to combine them all into a single spreadsheet. Um, that's some simple copying, pasting, nothing, nothing too tricky there. Uh, you'll, I drew the arrows um, for maximum clarity that I'm just copying over the price list into a new sheet, uh, the counter data into a second sheet, and the additional coverage into a third sheet. Um, and while that's helpful, uh, the ideal is to have the usage and the additional coverage and the price all side by side in one sheet. So to do that, uh, I use VLOOKUP. What it's for is searching for and returning data that matches the criteria you provide it. It asks you to give a lookup value, table array, column index number, and range lookup. And what that essentially means is you can tell it the ISSN, tell it the sheet to go to, and it will return um, the data that you want. So uh, in this first screenshot at the top, I've created a new column, column E. I've titled it usage, and I've populated it with the VLOOKUP um, formula in Excel. And uh, you can see it is looking at the ISSN, it's going into my usage sheet and it's, it's pulling back um, what the counterfeit usage data was for the appropriate title um, whenever it finds an ISSN match. <clears throat> and I drew a little arrow again, just indicating that it is indeed um, pulling the correct data from sheet two into sheet one. So we will do that um, again with the additional coverage sheet. And I just wanted to show you a preview of it first. Uh, this is what it looks like. And it just lists anytime we have um, online coverage to this title through a different provider. Uh, so I've created a new column in that first sheet again, column F, uh, additional coverage column. And I've populated it again with the VLOOKUP formula. So it has run over to the additional coverage sheet. It's looked for matching ISSNs and it's returning um, the data when it finds a match. And so now we have the price, the usage, and the additional coverage all side by side. Um, the next thing I like to do is apply a little conditional formatting to the additional coverage column. You can find that under the home banner, highlight cell rules and text that contains. And um, if you're looking in a hypothetical situation like this at 400 titles, it can be hard to parse which of the additional coverages listed are actually current and what are just kind of, you know, six year embargoes through JSTOR or something like that. So um, we tell it to highlight green anything that has a current in an end parentheses because that can help when you're skimming 400 journals to see that you actually have current coverage somewhere else. Uh, and you'll see the two places where it highlighted it green. One, we have Project Muse coverage 2000 to current and the second one is um, Bio One current coverage. So uh, the next step that I usually do is somewhere at the top, just put what the cost would be were we to renew the entire package. Uh, in this case, I just had it sum the price list and it would be a little over $364,000. Um, but the exciting thing to do is <laughs> also use some if. And um, we're going to use some if in cell B2, which is right after cost of partial renewal, uh, to calculate 
in real time what it would cost were we to um, renew specific titles in this list. Uh, and what SUMIF does is return the sum of cells that meet the condition that you give it. And it asks for a range of criteria and a sum range. So we're gonna tell it the column to check, the value that it's going to check for, and then the column that has the data that we would like it to sum. Um, and that might not have made total sense, <laughs> but uh, sort of how it works out is in column D in this screenshot, it's a brand new column I just added. I called it new and anytime I thought we should renew the title, um, I wrote yes. And so under cost of partial renewal, what it's doing is saying, look in the renew column. If you see the word yes, just add those prices together. So it's pretty simple. Um, and I find this helpful because uh, you can just sort of see in real time what the savings would be. And so for this screenshot, I just said hypothetically, what if we only wanted to, to renew the 10 highest use titles that didn't have any additional coverage and had a cost per use of under $20? So what I did was sort column G, which is the usage column from high to low. And then I just wrote yes in the first 10 titles that uh, met the criteria of having no additional coverage and having a cost per use under $20. And so um, it looks at all those yeses and it calculated that that would be a little over $9,000. Um, I <laughs> promised Python, but again, I can't teach folks Python in the lightning round. But if you don't have any uh, computer programming background that's something that you're interested in. I just wanted to recommend this resource, Automate the Boring Stuff with Python. It has a wonderful cover um, and it's completely free uh, at his website, automatetheboringstuff.com. And it's, it's just a really good in introduction um, and it's totally worth checking out if you are interested. So uh, where does Python come in with what I just showed you? Well, uh, this is what we get from um, Alma when I look for overlapping coverage, all I do is ask Alma to retor return any um, active portfolios that match the ISSNs. And so you'll see that um, it means that there's multiple rows per title. So here, annual review of political science, um, we have coverage through annual reviews and through academic search premier, as well as through business source, source ultimate. But that's not particularly helpful um, having it formatted that way when trying to look at renewals. So I wrote a little script, which absolutely anybody could write with the help of that book um, that concatenates the information at the end. So you'll see it condensed annual review of political science to one row. Um, it summarized the usage data at the end and it, it actually condensed both EBSCO uh, portfolios into one because they have the same date range. And when I'm assessing renewals, it doesn't particularly matter to me if it's from Academic Search Premier or from Business Source Ultimate. Like I just need to know that we have it, but I don't need to know where necessarily which um, subscription it comes from. So uh, that was my whole talk. This, <laughs> this is my cat banjo. Um, there's loads more that I would like to talk about. Um, and if anybody has any questions about Excel or wants to go into um, more information about like nesting formulas or using if error or things like that, um, or if you want to see the Python script, please don't hesitate to email me or ask a question at the end of the um, lightning round. So thank you. There we go. <laughs> Thank you to all our presenters. Um, I'm gonna go scroll through the chat real quick and look for questions. Um, oh yes, will the recording be shared? Yes, it will. The recording and the slides will be shared later. Um, Okay, Michael and Rochelle, I'm not sure if you'd already answered this question in the chat, but um, someone was asking, does your project only involve bound journals or did this e extend to other serial formats such as microfilm and microfiche? Uh, thanks, I believe we tried to answer that in the chat, but yeah, we're, we're considering both bound journals and other formats as well.
And I think it was a similar question uh, for Rachel, Rachel King. Um, if online access is available for multimedia items, what are the protocols for the physical items? In other words, are you are you retaining your physical items or, or not? Um, that is a that's a good question. I should I mean I should just say that um, I you know I, I'm speaking as someone who is sort of um, straddling a couple different institutions and in that I'm very new to my new institution and in fact not in the same kind of role um, and I'm sort of reflecting on that. What I would say is that the uh, the institution that I transitioned from has actually kind of abandoned their collection during the pandemic. And that was sort of the impetus behind my, um, it, behind my wanting to speak on the, on the topic, because I think that it, these collections are just a little hard to deal with and being sort of left behind. There's an assumption, I think, on the part of administrators to sort of feel like, okay, well, we've all got it covered because look at the richness of the huge, I mean, if we look in terms of numbers, there are, like, we have much richer collections that are now that are digital, um, but they're subscription based and the, the kind of like, bespoke quality of uh, the collections is actually kind of being lost. And so, um, um, yeah, it's a, I mean, in answer to your question, uh, I, I, like I'm not in, in a position to be working with those collections, but the, the talk is sort of a response to the fact that I think that physical collections are being jettisoned as being difficult to deal with. And there's a question uh, from Michael. It's what did you do with the freed up staff time? I'm assuming they mean after you, you know, if you were able to downsize some of your print collection and you're, and you're not going to maintain your subscriptions. That's a great question. Um, the staff member who currently does our receiving and labeling for, for all incoming material, uh, he's now learning to catalog ebooks. He's helping out with a bunch of retroactive print projects, such as a, a reclassification project for some of our older Dewey class materials. So uh, we're, he's, we're definitely keeping him busy. <laughs> oh, and another question for Michael. Um, it says, was there, was there any analysis of the titles in special collections? And could you share what criteria is used to place a title in special collections versus the general collections? That's a great question. And we didn't really do a deep an analysis uh, on the special collections material because the purpose of those collecting efforts were so different. Um, the special collections at this point, they're not collecting any scholarly journals. They're really collecting journals that are primary sources, uh, ongoing alternative press publications, um, zines, anything along those lines. Uh, so the purpose of that really isn't access, but really about preservation and collecting depth. Uh, so right now we haven't done a, a deep dive into those, um, although that will certainly be something that we can take a closer look at in the coming years. And I see there's another question right underneath that. Um, uh, when evaluating electronic access to print journals, do you make a distinction between everything we have in print we have online versus we only have access to some of what we have available in print? Um, so I guess the answer to that would be um, if the online access was comparable to the print access, we did count as online access JSTOR access with rolling walls um, because we assume that if uh, any need for recently published material could be met through ILL. And because the vast majority of these materials were in the humanities and social sciences, our experience has been that the majority of usage, regardless of format, is uh, five or more years old. So the impact is, it would be fairly minimal uh, on patrons. And there's a question for Emily. Um, how does your process for evaluating cancellation cost savings compared to the process of unsub.org, if you've had a chance to compare them? Yeah, I've, I've um, looked at unsub and it, <laughs> I guess, so there was a really good talk at Charleston conference last summer um, about unsub and how there are sort of a lot of hidden assumptions in, into it that like sort of hidden programmatically in it. Um, and so I suppose what I like about doing it on my own in Excel is that I know all the assumptions I'm making, you know? Um, I, I don't have to guess at, at what's going on there. But that being said, I, 
Unsub was was a very pretty uh, program to look at, and it, it makes some beautiful graphs. And if you're trying to convince um, somebody as to why you should or shouldn't cut something, data, vis, data visualization can help with that. And I think um, sort of the interface that Unsub provides um, can can be useful in making that kind of argument. Um, and it, it's sort of <laughs> maybe too large of a question for, for me to address here, but um, I would definitely recommend talking checking out that. Um, recording if it's still available. Okay, another question for Emily. Um, does the ALMA report include consortial and institutional databases? Uh, some of our collections are provided by the consortium, so I wasn't sure if the report would capture that data. Um, it only includes information in ALMA, so I, we don't have any consorti consorti consortial um, subscriptions that are managed outside of that, so it would capture them, but um, it wouldn't capture any databases that we don't have active portfolios for, which is certainly some of the databases that we do have subscriptions to um, if they're Lincoln record collections. But you could get around that if you just down downloaded the title list from the vendor um, and then ran, um, you know, use the VLOOKUP off of the ISSNs that are in that title list um, if you have the, the full subscription to that database. There's another question for Michael. Um, could you clarify, was there any deselection involved with your analysis and really ending print subscriptions? The focus was uh, on ending the, the print subscriptions, but there was some deselection involved. Um, for example, those 30 titles that had online access, if that online access was permanent and stable through JSTOR, for example, then we would deaccession the print. Um, but if it was through an aggregator database, if it might easily go away at some point, uh, then we retain the print. And we didn't weed anything based on low usage. That's, that would sort of be a different, um, a different process. Okay, well, we, have a, we actually have a few more minutes. If there's any last questions, pop them in the chat. Um, I'm not seeing any more questions. So, well, actually, um, there's one here. Has there been any reaction to the print suspensions at UConn yet? Uh, not yet. We are currently still in a closed stacks environment. So patrons haven't really had access to the collections. Um, and scan on demand takes about as long as interlibrary loan. So the turnaround time for electronic delivery of PDFs really hasn't changed regardless of whether we own the print volume versus we're getting it from elsewhere. Um, but we're reopening in the fall, so we shall see. Okay, it looks like that's it for the questions. Uh, thank you to our panelists. This was really exciting. Um, and for people who asked, um, the recordings in the slide will be made available uh, through, the, through the website in a few weeks. And, um, I'm assuming people will get updates about that.